This is Jose Merino, Editor-in-Chief of the Neurology Family of Journals. The Neurology Podcast provides practical information to neurologists and other clinicians to help them provide better care for their patients. Thanks for listening and have a great week. Hello and welcome. This is Justin Abadamarco with the Neurology Podcast team in Cleveland Clinic. Today, we're joined by Nico Landau Siano peterson to discuss his article published in into Perineoplastic Neurological Syndromes Associated with Merkel Cell Carcinoma. Nico works for the Biomedical Research Institute of Malaga in Spain and at the French Reference Center on Perineoplastic Neurological Syndromes and Autoimmune Encephalitis of Lyon in France. Nico, thanks for joining us today and helping to expand this ever-evolving field of autoimmune neurology. Thank you, Justin, for the invitation. It's a privilege to be here. Can you tell us, what did you find with this association with Merkel cell carcinoma and these perineoplastic diseases? This field was pretty interesting to study. We would highlight mostly that those disorders are extremely rare conditions. with only 30 privileged reported cases in the literature. And well, we were able to put up a cohort of 17 additional cases. From a clinical point of view, it's worth to mention that they have a very heterogeneous clinical spectrum, mainly represented by Lambert and myasthenic syndrome, rapidly progressive cerebellar syndromes, so in some cases even an overlapping of Lambert and cerebellar syndromes, and then by encephalomyelitis. From an immunological point of view, I would highlight that they also have a very heterogeneous antibody profile, mainly represented by H2 antibodies, CB2, CREMP5, and in patients with Lambert and myasthenic syndrome by voltage-gated calcium channels. And well, in a small cohort of patients, I will also mention that we found some other atypical or poorly characterized antibodies targeting a wide variety of neurofilament chains. And then as a last point, I would mention that one of the most intriguing features of this paraneoplastic neurological syndromes is that up to 50% of patients had a spontaneous primary tumor regression with Merkel cell carcinoma lymph node metastasis at PNS onset, and especially among patients with multigated calcium channels and Lambert and myasthenic syndromes. Yeah, as you mentioned, some small numbers here, like a total cohort of 47 patients, but some interesting correlations and themes emerging with this tumor and then some key neurological syndromes. You mentioned limbs, this rapidly cerebellar kind of picture, degeneration, and then encephalomyelitis. And then I think we can dig into the antibodies and that response or regression in a tumor in a little bit. I have never made the diagnosis or even raised the possibility of Merkel cell, which makes me think I've missed it. Could you talk to us a little bit about like what should a neurologist know about that disease? Are there certain risk factors that should raise the suspicion for that where we should be getting some help from our dermatology colleagues? Is there anything on examination that that's a potential that needs to be explored? Well, I agree with you that before digging into this theme, I may have skipped this diagnosis before, but I think that what we need to know is that they are rare. So don't worry, we may have not missed that many cases, but well, we have to know just that they are rapidly growing masses or nodules, plaques, painless with a pinky, bulacious color that usually are raised in sun-exposed skin areas like the head, the neck arms or even the legs, since ultraviolet radiation is one of the most important risk factors. They occur mostly only exclusively in elderly Caucasian patients. And the last risk factor that we have to know and we have to consider is that they frequently occur in patients that are chronically immune suppressed. And this interesting fact led to the discovery a decade ago of one of the most important oncogenes or oncoviruses that uh, are related to the development of this disorder, that is the Merkel cell polyomavirus. Even the virus got the name of the tumor, so you can imagine that it's one of the main risk factors, and they have a particular role, a special role in the, the development of this cancer. Okay, but that's still a really helpful construct to think about it. We're thinking about this in our elderly population, and we should be thinking or looking in areas that are exposed to sunlight commonly with these characteristics that you mentioned, and then a background of immunosuppression for whatever reason should also raise our suspicion. Does that sound right? I would mention just that in microscopically or histological way, they are gathered into the so-called group of small cell cancers, same as the small cell lung cancer that is so frequently associated with PNSs, and just that they also express a group of antigens that make the immunohistochemically diagnosed, and I would only highlight among those 
markers, CK20 neuroendocrine markers like chromogranin A, synaptophysin. Interestingly, we can also find in the immunohistochemical uh, analysis neurofilament in those tumors. And as I said before, we can also find Merkel cell polyomavirus oncoproteins that are found in up to 80% of patients. I think that is some helpful background and a link some maybe potential pathophysiology on why these could be so immunogenic. So classified under that neuroendocrine tumor classification scheme, we think of that with small cell lung carcinoma, which is highly associated with other perineoplastic diseases. And then this particular cancer seems to be highly immunogenic in certain patients. Is, is that right? Neuroendocrine tumors are rare. They're heterogeneous group of tumors that are raised likely from nervous or endocrine cells throughout the body, mainly in the respiratory system or gastrointestinal system. And they are so-called neuroendocrine tumors because they express biomarkers that can or usually appear in the nervous system or in the endocrine system. As I said before, those antigens or the most frequent antigens they express is chromogranin A and synaptophysin among others, more specific antigens, depending on the kind of neuroendocrine tumor. The most important and characteristic feature of this kind of tumors is that they produce pyroneoplastic syndromes in general. The most frequent pyroneoplastic syndrome they cause are related to the ability to produce metabolically active substances, and then they cause a very wide variety of symptoms. But then, in a very small proportion, they are also associated with paraneoplastic neurological syndromes, which are the kind of disorders we're facing. And as you already know, those disorders are immune-mediated and are thought or considered to target antigens that are ectopically expressed by the tumors that are usually or exclusively presented in the nervous system. Although, well, this kind of mechanism is not the only one, and likely recent studies have proved that other Features are also important for the pathogenesis of those disorders. But, well, the ectopic expression of those antigens are considered to be one of the main mechanisms involved. I think that's a really helpful background. So you've reviewed all the cases at the National French Reference Center, which really is going to see the majority of cases in France, which is helpful. And then you also looked at cases via systematic review, so trying to be as comprehensive as we can. And you're looking to see neurological symptoms within two years of the Merkel cell carcinoma diagnosis. Can you talk about how these patients presented? What was their temporal course? The clinics were heterogeneous. The timeline was also heterogeneous. In most cases, the paraneoplastic neurological syndrome was the first sign and led to the discovery and the diagnosis of the tumor. But in some other cases, as uh, we can see, we observed that after a first screening for a cancer, nothing was found. And then some patients were found to have small or not that obvious or frequently observed lymph node metastasis with Merkel cell carcinomas, even though subsequent dermatological examination didn't find a primary tumor in the skin. The thing is that, well, I wanted to mention that since 60% of patients had a Merkel cell carcinoma lymph node metastasis but didn't have a primary skin tumor, That makes this diagnosis even harder. They make us question whether the neurological symptoms are related to this lymph node metastasis or not. And, well, it makes even harder and even more special this kind of cases. Especially if we consider that only 3% of patients with Merkel cell carcinoma have this kind of presentation, the spontaneous primary tumor regression with lymph node metastasis. But when they are presented in patients with paraneoplastic neurological syndromes, it's up to 60% of patients. This finding will make us think or make us suggest to the thought that maybe those patients has an enhanced anti-tumor immune response. That could be one of the main drivers of these disorders. And interestingly, this is not only seen in this kind of tumor. This phenomenon was also described in COT11 encephalitis, who also present burnt out or spontaneously regressed testicular tumors with lymph node metastasis, and even in some cases of small cell lung cancer and paraneoplastic neurological disorders and A2. I really like linking this back to other perineoplastic diseases that we talk about, especially the point you made at the top, right? The neurological syndrome will sometimes or usually precede the diagnosis of cancer, giving us this opportunity to hopefully make the diagnosis a little earlier, give oncology a little bit more time and space to really get this under control. But we do think that there's this complex relationship between a tumor and the uh, immunological or the immune system, which can make things challenging, including making this diagnosis. 
Could you talk about the antibodies that you saw? I know you mentioned a couple, again, at the top of the podcast, but can we talk about those and which clinical presentations do they link with? So regarding the antibodies, as we probably discussed, both dedicated calcium channels were the most frequently seen, followed by H2 antibodies and neurofilament antibodies. Regarding bolted gates of calcium channel antibodies, they were, as they were previously described, mostly among patients with LEMS. Then they were also seen in patients with uh, rapidly progressive cerebellar syndromes. And in some cases, they were seen in patients with an overlapping phenotype of LEMS and cerebellar syndromes, suggesting a common underlying immune mechanism. Even though those antibodies are known or have been seen to cause different symptoms in animal models, depending on the symptoms of the patients, they didn't cause the same symptoms in the animals. When the antibodies were from a patient with LEMS or from a patient with cerebellar syndrome. And it's also interesting to mention that this overlapping between LEMS and cerebellar syndrome was also observed in uh, small cell lung cancer related paranoplastic neurological syndromes. That makes us think that the nature of both disorders, of both tumors, small cell lung cancers and Merkel cell carcinomas, have many, many features in common. Another interesting fact regarding H2 antibodies is that they were seen among patients with an heterogeneous clinical phenotype, mostly encephalomyelitis, sensory neuronopathy, also in patients with cerebral progressively cerebellar syndrome, autonomic ganglionopathy. But interestingly, it was not seen among other high-risk phenotypes were not seen that can be seen, for example, in small cell lung cancers, like uh, limbic encephalitis, for example. And then... One of the main points of this study was the identification of antibodies against different neurofilaments. All patients with antibodies against neurofilaments presented central, ner central nervous system disorders, mainly rapidly progressive cerebellar syndrome and brainstem encephalitis, although they were also seen among patients with uh, myelitis, with isolated, uh, isolated myelitis. The role as, as biomarkers of those antibodies are still to be defined since they were initially uh, discovered and proposed as a biomarker of autoimmunity in a cohort of patients with different tumors, even some patients with post-infectious neurological disorders. And in the largest cohort from Mayo Clinic, there were only light-chain neurofilament antibodies were strongly associated with neurological and central nervous system disorders and with malignancies of neuroendocrine in nature. The role of heavy-chain neurofilaments, medium-chain neurofilaments, light and alpha-intenexin uh, neurofilament antibodies are still to be uh, better defined. But well, it's interesting to, to comment that patients with Merkel cell-related paraneoplastic neurological syndromes can also express in the tumor all those neurofilaments. Therefore, they likely play a role, but and those findings support their role as a biomarker in paraneoplastic neurological syndromes. But larger cores need to be studied in order to make the final suggestion whether these antibodies are a real biomarker of paraneoplastic neurological syndrome or not. Yeah, definitely need to replicate these in other cohorts, but you've kind of put together this a little bit of a story, right? We talked about a higher risk cancer with this potential immunogenic background. We talked about some of the antigenic targets. So there seems to be some relationship that needs to be explored further. Nico, maybe we could end about how this paper and these findings really help inform your practice. Like what will you do differently moving forward given these results? Well, I would say that this work could be of help, especially uh, for general neurologists that faces a patient with a suspected paraneoplastic disorder and they don't get to find uh, a malignancy that can link, explain the, the development or the origin of the disorder, or they find they do find the tumor and they were not really aware or, well, it's not been previously established whether Merkel cell carcinomas are really responsible or linked to the development of these disorders. So, well, definitely it will raise awareness about this potential paraneoplastic origin of neurological disorders in patients with these rare malignancies. And since they will facilitate or raise awareness and facilitate their recognition, especially in patients with atypical presentations like lymph node metastasis for a small cell cancer that cannot be very well characterized, 
they will they will increase diagnosis. They will help to make a proper diagnosis, and they will therefore enable the administration of immunotherapy to try to improve patients' outcomes. And lastly, I will mention as well that the identification of those atypical antibodies, like neurofilament antibodies, they're not included in commercial antibody assays. They will then encourage referrals or reference research centers for advanced antibody testing that could help make us a link or make us make the diagnosis since the no identification of antibodies are not related or the, the absence of antibodies can sometimes make it hard to make the diagnosis of these disorders. So the referral to those places will be extremely helpful in, in the future. I think it's a perfect summary. And yeah, asking for help whenever we need it on those really complicated patients is always really useful. Nico, thanks for coming on. Again, this is a fast moving field that's challenging to keep up with. Understanding some of these relationships and knowing what to look for is super important. Please check out the article published into Paraneoplastic Neurological Syndromes Associated with Merkel Cell Carcinoma. Nico, thanks again. Thank you, Justin, for the invitation. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please take a few moments to subscribe, rate, and review the Neurology Podcast through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And remember, you can always head to neurology.org backslash podcast for our full list of past episodes, or you can also search by keyword in your podcast app for any neurology-specific topics you want to learn about.